Well, I mentioned last week that we were going to study Isaiah chapter um, 9, verse 6 for the four weeks preceding Christmas. This is the, uh, the second Sunday of Advent. There's only two more Sundays before Christmas. It's hard to believe, but it's almost here. And so we want to take a look again at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And this time we're going to look at the second title that it's applied uh, to this coming Messiah King that Isaiah prophesies about. The Lord had told David through Nathan the prophet that although he wouldn't get to build the temple for the Lord, his son Solomon would. But he also told David that his throne would be established forever. Now we know that, th that there have been uh, recent generations of leadership in Israel that weren't descendants of King David. And so one has to ask the question, well, what did he mean by that, that his, his throne would be established forever? And the only logical explanation, the only logical scriptural explanation to that is that there would someday then be an everlasting king who would be a descendant of David, who would make sure that the throne continued on forever and ever. And, and so we, we know that when, when Nathan the prophet announced these things to David through the Spirit of God, that God was actually talking about the Messiah that was to come. And Isaiah's prophecies pertain to that same individual. Isaiah is not the first one, as we've mentioned before, to prophesy about a coming Messiah king. Uh, Isaiah simply tells us some details and gives some titles to this Messiah king uh, that were previously unknown. The nature of the Messiah wasn't, wasn't clear in the Old Testament. But Isaiah helps to make it clearer for us than many of the other passages do. And so let's read again verses 1 through 7. Isaiah chapter 9. It says, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past he humbled the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, but in the future he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as a people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat you have shake, shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and especially for these prophecies that foretold long before he came things about your son, the Messiah, that would be true of him. And so, Father, we have the enjoyment of being able to look back and see how you in your uh, omniscience revealed to the prophets of old things about your son, the Messiah, uh, that weren't known before. And then to watch them unfold in the New Testament as we see Jesus fulfilling prophecy after prophecy after prophecy, helping us to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus truly was the one spoken of by Isaiah the prophet. And so, Father, as we continue this study, con confirm us in our faith. Help us to be stronger in it. Uh, help us to realize that, that uh, the ages lie in, in your hands and in your power and that you direct the affairs of men so as to accomplish your will, even as you did in relationship to Jesus' birth and then his death and his resurrection. Uh, so, Father, we thank you again for your word. Help us to, to be encouraged and strengthened by it this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We mentioned last week that Isaiah's prophecy clearly speaks of both a child and yet at the same time someone who would be much more than a normal child, much more than a normal human being. Again, verse 6 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And so we see the humanity of this coming 
Messiah King. And yet at the same time, it goes on and it says, and the government will be on his shoulders. So we, we can deduce that he'll be a governmental leader, but that could be true of a normal human being. But then these titles come up that will be applied to this individual. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The four titles here given by the Spirit of God to Isaiah 700 years before Jesus' birth could never literally refer to a normal human being. Nor could they refer to simply an extraordinary human being. Uh, someone like the men of renown that the Bible talks about in the Old Testament. This verse is so clear that it is perplexing to those who don't know about the incarnation or those who don't believe that God could become a man. There are Jewish commentators that say these titles are used simply as majestic references to a mighty hero that would be a king, possibly a replacement for King Ahaz. Now it is true that El Gabor, the title that we looked at, I mentioned last week, that is, is the Hebrew phrase for Almighty God here, El being translated as God in the Hebrew language, or in the English language, from Hebrew to English, and Gabor meaning hero. And, and so it was applied, um, rightly translated as well as mighty, uh, but it could be simply a hero God. And, and what happens is that those people who don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, modern day commentators on the Old Testament and ancient commentators on the Old Testament who didn't know about the incarnation and didn't see the incarnation in the Old Testament uh, try to explain away the titles of this passage by saying that all that is meant by mighty God is simply a, a reference to a mighty hero. Uh, some sort of king that would be a mighty hero in the eyes of the people. But there's a problem with that. The problem is, is that when we try to determine the meaning of words, we don't simply look at our own, our own uh, frame of reference, our own bias, our own preconceived ideas about what a passage is saying. We have to look at the context. One of the things I drill uh, to when I'm teaching hermeneutics in Belarus is I say to the students all week long, I say, remember the context, remember the context, remember the context. Always look at the context, both the immediate context, the verses surrounding this verse and the verse itself, and the remote context, that is the verses that are found in other parts of the particular author's writings. And as we do that, what we see is that Isaiah uses El Gabor not to refer to some mighty human being king ruler, but instead he uses it of God. We mentioned last week that we, we see that in verses 20 and 21 of Isaiah 10. In fact, you may want to write that down if you write in your Bibles in, in the margin right beside Isaiah 9, 6. Just write down Isaiah 10, 20, and 21. Where there it is clear that Isaiah is speaking about Jehovah God and it is also clear that El Gabor is Jehovah God. In verse 20 of Isaiah 10, it says, In that day the remnant of Israel, the survivors of the house of Jacob, will no longer rely on him who struck them down, but will truly rely on the Lord. And that's in all capitals, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, which means Jehovah. That's the, the way that the translators of the King James Version, in fact, every version that I'm aware of, uh, translates the Hebrew names of God by using um, either for Jehovah, they use all capitals. Uh, for L, they'll use small letters. There's, there's a pattern that is faithful through all the translations. Whenever you see all capitals for Lord, that comes from the Hebrew word, and we call it the tetragrammaton. It's the personal name of God, which we, we say Jehovah, uh, it probably more correctly is pronounced in Hebrew as Yahweh or Yahweh. And the reason we don't know um, exactly how it's pronounced is because the Jewish people did not pronounce it. Whenever they came to that word, in fact, Jewish people today, those that are religious Jews, uh, they still don't pronounce God's name and they don't write God's name. Uh, we had a, a um, Messianic Jewish family that attended the school here. Uh, the father was a doctor in the area and whenever his daughter would come up to the blackboard to write a verse, I, ha I had her when I was teaching here, uh, she would write G-D. She wouldn't even spell out G-O-D because that's a part of their tradition. They, out of a desire not to violate the, the commandments and, and they don't want to take the Lord God's name in vain, which doesn't mean simply as a profanity. That's how we think of it today, but it means using it without meaning. 
And then, so we don't know. The bottom line is there, there's no oral tradition as to how God's name was pronounced. There were also no vowel points. What makes it tricky? You could say, well, why don't we just sound it out? Ancient Hebrew had no vowel points. The vowel points weren't added until around 800 AD, 800 years after Jesus came. And they were added by a group of scribes called the Masoretes. You say, well, how could they add the vowel points? Because they knew the oral pronunciation of the Hebrew language, except for when it came to the name of God. And so to this day, we really don't know exactly how God's personal name, whether it's Yahweh or Yahweh, how it was pronounced. And you say, well, that sounds a lot different than Jehovah. That's because uh, as English speakers, we say we pronounce the Y sound in Hebrew with a J sound. For example, you say Jerusalem, right? But if you go to Israel, they say Yerushalem with a Y sound. And, and so that, that's, that accounts for the difference there. Anyway, so Isaiah uses it in context. Isaiah uses El Gabor to refer to Jehovah God. Also, it's clear that in the context, as you look at the context, that this individual had a much wider um, span of influence than any normal human, would be, human being could have. In fact, it says his kingdom would go on forever. No human being can have a kingdom that goes on forever because we eventually pass away. But this king who would come would have a kingdom that would last uh, forever. And so as we look at the way that Isaiah uses the phrase El Gabor and as we look at the context and how it's used in this particular passage, uh, there, I think there's no question that it is a speaking of a, a child that would come that would not be a normal human being. And I don't mean he, by that I don't mean he would be an abnormal human being either. But that he would be something unique, something special, something far above a normal human being. Also, for those of us who live today, who have the advantage of hindsight, who can look back at the Old Testament or at the uh, New Testament writings and see how the Spirit of God directed the authors of the New Testament uh, to go back and write about the prophecies of old, we see that Isaiah's prophecies are applied to the Messiah. Under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, the gospel writers quoted from Isaiah and applied it to Jesus. So for us today, there is no question that El Gabor is not simply a mighty hero king, but that instead it is the mighty God. Now this second title, Almighty God, when used of Jehovah in other places of the Old Testament, often had to do with God's power to defeat any enemy or give victory to whoever he desires. That's how they use the, or when they use the title Almighty God. It really has reference to battle, to warfare. And when Israel would experience a victory, they would often refer to God in giving him thanks as Almighty God, El Gabor the hero God, the one who gives victory. You see, they recognize something that we're beginning to fail to recognize is that no battle is won by the strength of an army or by the number of horses or by how many soldiers you have or how skilled those soldiers are. The Bible says the battle belongs to the Lord. Israel recognized that. It's, I, it bothers me when I hear our leaders today say things like, well, we will win this war without saying by God's grace or if God be willing or, or, or giving credit to God somehow. Because we can't win in and of our own strength. It is the Lord who gives victory. And this title, El Gabor, oftentimes was used in that kind of context. In fact, another good reference to make note of is Psalm 24, verse 8, where we see this quite clearly. Psalm 24, verse 8 says, Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. And so Israel recognized that it was God who gives victory in battle. Now, I think it's extremely, uh, I, what would I say? I don't want to say coincidental. I'm, I'm being, sar sar not sarcastic, but a little bit <laughs> satirical here, that today, today is the beginning of a Jewish holiday. Actually, tonight is. You know what tonight is for the Jewish people, starting at sundown? Hanukkah. Hanukkah is held on Kislev, the 25th of the Jewish calendar. Now, their months don't always coincide with ours, and that's why on the Gregorian calendar that we use today, Hanukkah 
uh, occurs on different dates because we use two different calendars. The Jews use a calendar that actually begins with what they believe to be the date of creation and, and has continued all the way through. So it's year 5,000 and something on the Jewish calendar. And their months are different than ours. It's also a lunar-based calendar where ours is a solar calendar. And so it's constantly changing in relationship to our calendar. So Kislev 25 this year occurs tonight. Also the Jewish day begins at sundown. So it begins at sundown and ends at So today is Kislev 24 on the Jewish calendar, but by 6 p.m. tonight it will be Kislev 25th on the Jewish calendar. And tonight starts the eight days of Hanukkah celebrations for the Jewish people. And you say, well, why is it so coincidental or, or interesting or uh, um, just in the providence of God? Why is that, uh, why, how's that tie in with what we're talking about today? Uh, Hanukkah is a celebration of the Jews' victory over the Seleucid Empire, over Antiochus IV Epiphanes and, and the, their rule over the Jewish people. It, it is the day, Kislev 25th, is the day when, when uh, Judas Maccabeus and the other Jews who were victorious in battle against the Seleucid Empire rededicated the temple to God. You see, when Antiochus came into Israel, the land of Judah, because of some uprisings and rebellions, he came in and he, he decided to squash the Jews. And, and he did things not only to, to de demonstrate his power over them, but to, to really humiliate them. And so one of the things he did was he offered a swine. He took a pig, which most of you know is unclean in Judaism. And he offered a pig on the altar in the Jewish temple and allowed its blood to run down over the altar and he defiled the Jewish temple. And then he did not allow the Jews, they, they carried on all sorts of pagan activities in the Jewish temple and they did not allow the Jews to worship in their temple anymore. And so they lived under that kind of o oppressive and, and um, what would you call them? Just the, uh, leaders who didn't mind humiliating and you know they weren't worried about being politically correct. <laughs> anyway, we've gone the opposite extreme. They could care less. And then what happened is that the Jews kept praying that the Lord would free them from these oppressors and, and, a, and a man came on the scene by the name of Judas Maccabeus. The two uh, Apocrypha books that are found in the Catholic scriptures and the Catholic canon, they're considered deuterocanetical by the Catholic Church. They see them as being inspired. Most Protestants do not. But the books of First and Second Maccabees record the story of the Maccabean revolt. And, and it's an amazing story of how this uh, small nation of Israel was able to overthrow the rule of the Seleucid Empire uh, and, and how they did it. They did it basically through a, 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 a what would you call it, a, a form of guerrilla warfare. Small bands of Jewish people would be organized to attack um, uh, Antiochus and his armies and, and then run. It's sort of the, you know, attack them now and then run and, and fight another day in another place and attack them again. And, and, and eventually God gave them the victory and on Kislev 25th they rededicated the temple to God. And so this title, El Gabor, would have been a, a, a title used in their praises to God because on that day, um, they, this is the story of the, the menorah. Uh, the menorah was one of the candlestick in, in, the, um, in the holy place of the temple. And they, after they rededicated the temple, they wanted to light the candlestick, but they have to use a sacred oil. And they only had one container. They could only find one container of sacred oil. And according to Jewish tradition, it dated all the way back to the time of Samuel the prophet. And it was sealed, and they opened that, but there was only enough for the menorah to burn for one day. They poured the oil into the menorah, and it takes while to, a while to, to crush the olives and to make new olive oil that could be burned in the menorah. And it takes approximately eight days, is what tradition says. But miraculously, the candle that only had enough oil in it to burn for one day burned for all eight days until they could actually find new oil that, that wasn't um, defiled that they could use in the menorah. And so that's why the, the Hanukkah um, celebrations go for eight days. It starts tonight and it'll, go, it'll continue for eight days. And it's been going on like that since the days of Judas Maccabeus, which was before Jesus. In fact, we find in John chapter 10 in the New Testament era, uh, it wasn't called Hanukkah. It was called the Festival of Lights. 
And you remember Jesus in John chapter 10, when we were studying the Gospel of John, Jesus was in the temple on that festival day. What was he doing there? The Jews celebrated by giving praise to God. Uh, they, they, they sang songs, to, uh, actually psalms. They sang, sang psalms to God, and, and they prayed to God, and they feasted. That's how they celebrated this victory giving honor to God. And Jesus was in the temple doing that, participating in those prayers and in those praises and in that feasting. And it's at that time when he declares himself as the menorah is burning and the Jewish people would be keenly aware of God's miraculous hand in their life and in their affairs. And it's at that time that Jesus says, I am the light of the world. As the menorah is there burning. And it's just, it, it's an amazing, amazing announcement to the Jewish people, no doubt. Although we wouldn't be surprised by that announcement because we wouldn't make the same associations they did. They knew what he was claiming. And, and even if they didn't understand it in its entirety, they knew this is something that no other person would claim. And so it, it, it's a, a very appropriate title. And in the providence of God, it just happens that our study works out so that it, it coincides with a holiday that would remember God giving victory to Israel. El Gabor giving victory to Israel. Now as the Messiah King, not only would Jesus have all wisdom so that he could be the wonderful counselor that we talked about last week, but he also has all strength. Jesus being very God of very God, the second person of the Trinity, is just as omnipotent as God the Father is. That is, he is just as all-powerful as God the Father is. And so it's no wonder he's called the Almighty God, since he is over everything and has all power. In fact, his power is seen in, in, in his victories that he gives to men and in the way that he fights for men. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, the worst enemy that mankind will ever face the most powerful political leader that will ever set foot on this planet outside of Jesus himself is the Antichrist. We see that as we, as we look at the book of Daniel, as we look at Ezekiel, and as we look at the book of Revelation. We see the Antichrist conquering the nations of the world. And he becomes the world ruler in the last days during what we call the tribulation. And let, let, listen, listen to how Jesus defeats him. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, And when the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Here we have a demon-possessed man. If he is just a normal man at all, I'm assuming that he is from my understanding of Scripture, but a demon-possessed man who is capable of doing things that no other political leader has ever done, who manages to conquer all sorts of nations, is a, is a world leader, and, and controls all of these armies that will rebel against the Lord, and all the Lord does is he appears on that day when he comes back and whew, just blows it away like a little dust on your book. You know, and that's all it takes for the Lord to be victorious over individuals like the Antichrist. It goes on, it says, not only by the, pop, by the breath of his mouth. And I think, I think the Spirit of God wanted us to understand just how powerful God is by, by saying, I don't know if Jesus is really going to come and just do this. And all the armies are going to, you know, roll away into some place. I don't know. But I think, I think it may be that the author is just trying to say how easy it is for the Almighty God to have victory. But it also says that he destroys him by the splendor of his coming. Just the appearance of God is so magnificent that it in some way defeats his enemies. I don't know if it caused them to, to, to drop their weapons and, and just bow in fear or, or how it exactly it will unfold. The details aren't given to us. The general description is given to us and, and in that general description, we see how easy it is for God to conquer. And no wonder, because again, he is very God of very God. He is the second person of the omnipotent Trinity. In John chapter 1, we saw that quite clearly as we looked at verses 1 through 3 in the beginning of our study there, where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. 
And then at least if anybody had any doubt as to who John is making reference to, in verse 14 we see who he's making reference to. And it goes beautifully with this Isaiah 9-6 passage where it says the Word became flesh. Who was the Word? The one that was in the beginning with God and was God. The Word became flesh, verse 14, and made His dwelling among us. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so the Word is Jesus. And He is eternal. He is God. And therefore He is omnipotent. He is not the Father. He is the Son. And yet He has all of the same attributes and all of the same characteristics and all of the same power that God the Father has. Now this unique child that would be born that these titles refer to that Isaiah was prophesying about and that we see here in John chapter 1 having has this unique nature then that he is both a child that would be born of a virgin born of humanity so he is human and yet at the same time he is the wonderful counselor the mighty God the everlasting father the prince of peace clearly he is divine and so theologians have come up with a theological term to describe that. You may come across it sometimes. Uh, theologians refer to this unique union of God and humanity as the hypostatic union. And it comes from two Greek words, which I don't need to define, uh, but it's, it's a term that they use to define the relationship of, of God and humanity, of God becoming human. And again, this is seen quite clearly throughout the New Testament. John chapter 20, verse 28, Thomas said uh, to him, speaking to Jesus, my Lord and my God. So he's talking to a human being who is there in front of him at that time and yet who is clearly God at the same time. In John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one, a human being who is also at the same time God. In Titus chapter 2, verse 13, it says, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appear appearing of our great God, of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, both man and divine. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 says, For in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. All the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. A unique, a unique union that has never before occurred and that will never again occur. That is only true of Jesus. Where God in history past stepped into Humanity became a human himself so that he might die for our sins. And, and that's what Christmas is all about. Christ, as the El Gabor, demonstrated his almightiness as he exercised power over all of man's enemies. He cast out demons on multiple occasions in the scriptures. He cured any kind of illness that plagued man, any kind of disease, any kind of handicap or infirmity. He even conquered death. His might was seen in his power over nature as he controlled the wind and the waves and as he multiplied um, the food on the two mass feedings, one for 5,000 people, 5,000 plus, and the other for 4,000 plus. As he turned the water into wine, and not just a little bit, but several large containers. Christ not only possessed all power, he still possesses all power. And he can use it to aid us today. Christ can still deliver you from demons and from the power of sin. Christ can still give you victory in your life and help you to overcome obstacles that you think are insurmountable, that you can't in your own strength overcome. And you may be right in your own strength, you can't. But Christ is all-powerful. He is El Gabor. He can help you to overcome those things. Now it requires that we are full of Christ. That to overcome sin is not automatic. It doesn't happen the moment you become a Christian. Romans chapters, basically chapter 6 through chapter 8, talks about whom we yield ourselves servants to obey. His servants we are. And, and in the book of Ephesians, it talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And the way to overcome sin is to allow ourselves to be so full of Christ that we have his power in our lives and that we can then overcome temptation and sin and addictions and anything else that is unpleasing to the Lord. 
he can also still heal us if it's his will to do that again I, I I'm of the mindset that the scriptures teach that sometimes it's the will of God for people to be sick I don't believe that he wants everybody all the time healthy wealthy and wise I believe that's a false gospel I think it's clear in the scriptures that there are times when God uses infirmities and illnesses to humble individuals, to bring individuals to himself, to build character individuals, to teach us lessons, to help us to learn compassion and empathy for others who are suffering. There's a multitude of things that are learned through illness and disease. But he can heal us. He still is El Gabor and he has the power to do that. Christ has the power to enable you to do what you don't think you can do in your own human logic. He has the ability to help you to, to make ends meet when you don't think ends will meet. To be honest at your job, at your occupation, and to always tell the truth even though you may think that that will result in financial loss and that you can't survive with that kind of financial loss. Christ can make, help you to make it through those times. He can help you to make it through those times when you, you don't know how you will provide for yourself or for your family because he's El Gabor. And I've seen that happen in my life and I've seen that happen in the lives of others. I was listening to a real neat testimony on 91.1 the other day. Um, I think it was Focus on the Family about a man out in Los Angeles and I only heard a part of it as I was driving from one place to the other. And, and it talks about this guy who was working with inner city gang members at the age of 20. His dad dropped him off, a church kid, a preacher's son, who, who just felt the Lord was calling him to work with, with gang members in Los Angeles. And his, his dad told the story of how when he dropped him off at the corner. Did anyone hear that broadcast the other, yesterday? No? Well, it was fantastic. His dad dropped him off, and his dad, as he drove away, started to cry. He says, I've left my son to die. He really thought that his son would be killed by the gang members there in Los Angeles. Today, they have just finished purchasing an abandoned hospital that they have turned into a facility for housing the poor, feeding the poor, um, for helping them to get off the streets, uh, helping prostitutes and drug addicts and criminals and, and, and by the grace of God. And he says, you know, if you would have told me that we, we, if the price tag on that building, if you would have told me that price tag 20 years ago and said, someday you're going to be able to purchase that. He said, I don't know. I would have believed you. But it became possible, not, not because of uh, anything he did, but because of people who saw the ministry that he started to have in, with the gangs in L.A. Be, became supporters of the ministry individuals who gave to purchase those facilities and they, they're in the process of renting I guess they've renovated some of it and I didn't hear the whole story I wanted to hear the rest of the story um, but it was an amazing story and that, that that all has to do with the fact that we serve an almighty God El Gabor who can help you to do what you don't think is possible to do humanly logically in Revelation chapter 1 verse 18 not only do we see that El Gabor can help us in this life, he does something as well that all of us need to pay careful attention to. He helps us, in fact, he's the only one who can help us make it into the next life. Revelation 1.18 says, I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and ever and I hold the keys of death and Hades. This Messiah King came not simply to rule but also to give his life as a substitutionary payment for our sins so that you and I could have eternal life. This morning,